Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome to Mount Zion Church. My name's Devin Peterson. I'm the pastor here. Just want to welcome you. If this is your first time, thanks for joining us. So I heard this weekend we had an incredible women's conference. Who was a part of that? Now, I heard a rumor that my wife told one of my jokes. And I've just got to ask, was it funny? Then it was not one of my jokes. No, we, it, I, what I heard, it was a great event. Uh, they, did a, they did an awesome job, and we're so glad for uh, you all to have been a part of that. Hey, we want to give just a special shout-out this morning. Tomorrow is Veterans Day. If you are a veteran in the room today, if you would just stand to your feet, we want to honor you. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank them so much for your service. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You know, we should never forget the freedoms that we have in this nation, the rights that we have, the ability to come in. And every Sunday when we come and we sit down freely to worship, we need to remember that that came at a cost and it's come at a great sacrifice. But we thank you for your service and for all you've done to make our nation what it is today. Well, we are going to be starting a new sermon series this week called The Way of the Exile. The Way of the Exile, and today's sermon is Embracing Exile. And you might be wondering, what is an exile, and why are we talking about this? Well, just with everything going on in our nation right now, with the election having come and gone, and I know that there is a lot of uh, political unrest in our nation. I know even in our church here, there's a lot of different perspectives on political philosophy, and I felt it necessary to just preach a, a sermon series on the topic of, you know, we can all figure out the things we disagree on. It's not hard to do. In fact, I think if any of us sat down with any other person in this room, it would not be long before we would find something that we disagree on. That's human nature. But there's one thing that we agree upon, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. That's why we come together. That's why we worship together. And I think it's important that right now, as we move into this next season as a nation, that we remember what we are unified on, why we come together. So the way of the exile, we will be talking from Jeremiah. Our theme verse for this series will be Jeremiah 29, 11. Many of you are probably very familiar with it. If you'll read it with me. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, and Lord, I pray that you would move upon us in such a profound way. Open our hearts to receive your word. We believe by the hearing of the word of God, our faith grows. So I pray that you would grow us today as we hear your word. I pray even in those moments where something that we hear might be difficult for us to wrap our mind around, that you would expand our capacity to be able to grasp the greater perspective that you provide. I pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So what is exile? Maybe you're familiar with the term, maybe you're not. The simple definition of exile is the state of being barred from one's native country, typically for political or punitive reasons. Now, in the biblical context, whenever we talk about exile, we're most likely referring to the exile of the Israelite people. The Israelite people were a nation in the ancient world who uh, they, were, they came together as 12 tribes, the 12 tribes of, of Jacob, 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob was later, later called Israel. His 12 sons had families. They came together. At one point, they were very disunified, but under King David, they were unified into one kingdom. And historically speaking, this kingdom was a mighty, mighty nation, a force to be reckoned with, a great army that served uh, the world well, and they did not have many threats or enemies. In fact, at one point, Scripture says that all of their enemies were vanquished. This was under King David's leadership. King David was a mighty man of God, a man who is referred to as being a man after God's own heart. He was a worshiper through and through. The book of Psalms was written uh, primarily by David. And if you read through those Psalms, you'll see it just as a simple expression of a humble, humble man pointing his direction toward God. Now, David, being a man after God's own heart, had had 
gained God's attention, and God formed a covenant with David and said, one day there will be one who sits on your throne for eternity, and we know that to be Jesus Christ. But David's uh, legacy, unfortunately, did not continue with his son Solomon. His son Solomon did experience a great deal of peace in his kingship, but he did something very uh, unfortunate, and he began to marry many, many women and brought their idols into his home. And where the people of Israel were supposed to be a people, separated and only worshiping the one true God, he began to worship the one true God and these many idols that were brought into his home. His policies at that point caused him to increase taxation and to bring about social inequality in the kingdom. And God said to to Solomon, Because of your father David, I will preserve your kingship while you are on the throne. But as soon as your son takes over, the kingdom will be divided. And we we know historically that that happened. The kingdom later became divided into two nations. The northern half, which was Israel, and the southern portion, which was Judah. And when this separation took place, that nation that had once been very strong became very weakened. Their kings, most of them were not righteous people. The northern kingdom, in fact, had no righteous kings, and the southern kingdom only had a few. But even those who were righteous in some ways failed to live up to the standard that David had set and the standard that God had chosen for the people. So he began to raise up uh, prophets. Individuals who were tasked with the responsibility of calling the nations back to their first love, calling their nations back to the covenant which God had made with their forefather Abraham and made with the people at Sinai through Moses. Unfortunately, the people did not listen. And one prophet named Jeremiah, Jeremiah was a prophet, also a bullfrog. Anybody? That, that hit a little bit harder with the traditional service last night, but... <laughs> I had a professor that any time that we would talk about Jeremiah, he would make that joke, and I didn't know what he was talking about, but I guess it's funny. Um, But Jeremiah was a prophet raised up who began to tell the nation, you will experience exile if you do not come back to God and his covenant. Fortunately, they did not listen And so just as Jeremiah had prophesied, the people were conquered, the northern kingdom first conquered by Assyria, and the southern kingdom later conquered by Babylon. Now, Jeremiah was often referred to as the weeping prophet, or the prophet of doom, but also the prophet of hope. Because while he prophesied these terrible things were going to happen, he also prophesied that there was a coming king. This king that was promised to David would one day sit on the throne and he was coming and they needed to hold on to that hope. Jeremiah was called by God to prophesy during a very difficult time in the history of Judah. He had a difficult ministry. He faced persecution, ridicule, and threats from his own people. But despite all of that, his prophecies were fulfilled The Babylonian exile did take place. The nation of Babylon, who was a huge threat to Israel, God had kept them at bay for many, many hundreds of years, but now that they had turned their back on God and his covenant, he allowed them to be invaded, allowed them to be taken into exile. But even in the midst of that exile, Jeremiah continued to write to the exiles and give images of hope. His prophecies that we read in Scripture are one of the longest standing traditions in the Hebrew Bible. So what does this have to do with us? You see, there are three ways that people typically deal with exile. The first one, with there being three, there's two that will lead to death and destruction, and there's one that leads to life. We're going to be talking about the first two over the next couple weeks, and then our last week we will talk about the last and the life-producing way to experience Exile. The way in which many people experience exile is through revolt. They want to fight. They want to say, no, this isn't right. I'm not going to put up with this. Imagine if somebody came into your home like the Babylonians did with Israel and took you out of your home, took you out of your safety and your security. It would probably be your inclination to fight back, to say, no, I'm not going to allow this to happen. And that is the temptation 
But in Jeremiah 29, 1 through 4, giving some context, you know, that verse, our theme verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, is one of the most misunderstood verses in Scripture taken out of context. It's one of the most used Scriptures, but most people don't realize what was actually being said in that phrase. And you have to be very careful when you take a Scripture out of context and you don't consider what it meant to the audience then before you apply it to what it can mean to us now. So let's provide some context to this just a little bit. Jeremiah 29, verses 1 through 4. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exile, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by hand to Eleza, the son of uh, Shephan, and Gemaria, the son of Hilika, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, the prime reaction when you experience exile is to revolt. Historically, many have revolted when a conquering nation has come in to take over. Many have fought back, and historically, that has not served them very well. They didn't end up well. But our theme verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, is found in the context of the Babylonian exile. We often read this verse and we see this very hope-filled statement of, I know the plans and the purpose that I have for you. And we often read that verse or quote that verse thinking, that means that nothing bad will ever happen to me. But just know that that was uttered in the midst of a very, very bad time in the history of Israel. We cannot separate the things that God has planned for us from the season that we find ourselves in. We are in the middle of exile. You might say, well, how am I in the middle of exile? I'm in the nation that, that I was born in. I'm, I'm surrounded by those things that I'm familiar with. Yes, but we all experience exile in different ways. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 2, 11, the apostle Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh which war against your soul. See, he's speaking to a different type of exile He's not necessarily referring to this physical dislocation out of a nation that you were born in, but talking about a person who is in a place that is not their home. We know where our home is. If you've placed faith in Jesus Christ, you know that it doesn't matter who sits in an oval office, there is a king in heaven who reigns supreme. And we look forward to his return. We look forward to that day when he will return for us and we will have our home in heaven. But until that day, we are in exile. And when you read through the prophecies of Jeremiah, you see this message of hope that he gave them in the midst of the doom and the gloom was that there is a king coming. We know that that king has come and we know that he will come again. So the hope that we have is very similar to the hope that Jeremiah was giving to the exiles. But until he returns, we as believers are in exile. So if you feel like an exile today, good, because you are. In fact, I would even go as far as to say if you don't feel like an exile in the culture around you, you might want to step back and consider where you've placed your faith. In a person, in a system of government, you know, I'll just say this to challenge you a little bit this morning. If you felt your faith increase by the results of the election, then I think you need to stop and figure out where you actually place your faith. If you feel like your faith has been diminished by the result of an election, then you need to take a step back and figure out where you place your faith. Because it cannot be in a person. It cannot be in an agenda. It has to be in the king. This is what Jeremiah was saying. Jeremiah was saying, listen, I understand that you have authority over you, the king of Babylon. Yes, there is a certain level of loyalty and allegiance that you have to pledge to him in order to stay alive. But you need to know there is another king coming, the one to whom you are actually citizens of his kingdom. That's the same message to us today. We are exiles, and we need to understand that exile is God's chosen instrument for refinement and executing his plan. 
So how do we embrace this? Well, the first thing is we need to find God's purpose in exile. And maybe just to bring this into context, maybe exile for you is a season that you're walking through that you don't fully understand. Maybe it's a relationship that you're dealing with that you don't really know how to navigate. It's anything that makes you feel uncomfortable and you'd rather not be in it. Any situation that you find yourself where you'd say, I don't feel at home in this situation. I don't have that fuzzy feeling that I'm prone to. So how do we find God's purpose in the exile? Well, the first thing we have to realize is that our society is plagued with a hyperfixation on my story. Have you noticed that? My story, my truth, my destiny, my timeline. I can't tell you how many books I've seen recently written about my story, my destiny, my this, my that. Conferences all about my story, my story, all these things, my truth. So many people say, I know what the church preaches, but my truth is a little bit different. You really got to be careful when you start thinking that the truth of Scripture doesn't apply to you because your story is just a little bit different than everybody else. His story will always reign supreme. Now, this isn't to be confused with my testimony. We sang a song about that today. We need to hold on to our testimony. This is It looks like your story because you're a big player in it, but you need to realize that your testimony is actually his story working through you, and there's a big difference there. Can I just be real this morning? We tend to think of ourselves a lot more highly than we ought. We tend to think about the situations going around in our world today a lot more highly than we ought. We're not the first ones to go through discomfort, and we won't be the last. We are a very small part of a much larger story. If you took the whole timeline of history and tried to find your life on there, you wouldn't be able to because it would be microscopic. You're a very small part. And I don't mean that to diminish anyone in the room, but just to bring us back to a place of realizing we aren't as important as we think we are. He is. And we play a part in his story. Now listen, it's not bad to seek God's plan and purpose for your life. It's not bad to seek his destiny for you, but it can't become your preoccupation. You can't have this place of paralysis where you're not doing anything until you have a five-point plan of how to carry it out. You have to get to work. Here's what I've realized. Destiny usually finds you when you stop looking for it. A few years back, maybe four or five years, I really felt impressed in my heart that God was calling me to be a lead pastor. And of course, I did the natural thing and I began to look for opportunities to do that. And after a few churches said, great resume, but you're not what we're looking for, I became very discouraged. I became very frustrated. God, maybe I misheard you. I I, I don't know what to do. This is what you called me to do and I, I can't find a place for it. And finally, I got to a place where I said, God, if you're really calling me to this, then I'm not gonna have to look for it anymore. And it was in the moment that I laid that down that I came across a church in Bel Air, Maryland that was looking for a pastor. And suddenly I realized that all of that rejection that I had experienced was actually a good thing. It was actually God's plan. I didn't understand it, but you know what? I wasn't supposed to. I didn't need to understand it. Sometimes we have to let go of our need to understand what we're going through. We have to stop looking for that destiny and we'll find it. And here's the thing. You may never quite find what you're looking for, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be working. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be working in the meantime. You know, when you think about the timeline of history, there is one thing that every single generation has had in common, and it is the responsibility to produce and build up the next generation to instill the values and the principles in them so that the things that are important to you will not die with you, but will be carried on to the next generation. 
If you haven't figured out what your purpose and destiny is, then I would say, why don't you take some time and focus your attention on raising up the next generation because that is one place that I can tell you beyond the shadow of a doubt, the seed you plant will not come back void. We have young people in our congregation who need some people with experience to come alongside them and say, hey, I've walked where you've walked, and I want to be here as your encouragement to equip you, to help you navigate life in these difficult ways. We need more of that. We need our next generation. When you go to our kids' ministry or you go to our youth ministry or our young adults' gatherings, you need to look at those individuals as our next world leaders, as our next church leaders, as the next pastors of churches, if we don't pour into them, who will? Now, I'll tell you who it'll be, and we don't want to think that way because the people pouring into the next generation are filling them full of lies. We have the truth, and we have a responsibility. If you haven't figured out what your part in this story is, maybe start there because no matter what you do, a little bit or a lot, it will be fruitful. It will be fruitful. Why do we hate exile so much? Because we have a resistance to discomfort. Here's the reality. The Israelites, if you would have walked up to them in exile and said, hey, what do you want? They would have said, we want to go home, right? It's because they didn't fully understand what was taking place. See, we have to understand that resistance is the place that we are refined. You will not grow spiritually by just doing the things that are natural and comfortable to you. It won't happen. How do I know this? Because the same creator, the same refiner, the same one who began the good work, who will see it through to completion, also designed our bodies to work in a certain way, and there's a parallel between the two. You know, if you sit in a lounge chair all of your life, you're not going to develop the necessary muscles to function. In fact, what you do have will slowly begin to deplete and go away until you're unable to lift yourself out of that chair. So you have to do something to keep the muscle mass that you have. So if you find a place and maybe resistance training that's very comfortable and you just kind of lift those five-pound weights and, you know, you're going to have the muscle mass you need in order to function, but you'll never grow. Because the only way that your muscles will grow is when you find a place of discomfort, even just a little bit. And I don't know a whole lot about fitness, but I do know this. I know that if you grab a weight that's a little bit heavier than you're comfortable with, and you start to lift that weight, your muscle's going to send signals to the brain that say, there is a discomfort, and we need to get stronger so that we can lift the weight that's around us. If that's how our bodies work, our spiritual life works the same way. So what God tends to do is he puts you in a position where you're just a little bit uncomfortable. And you say, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. And he's saying, but this is where you grow. This is where I refine you. Because when you're in that place of discomfort, your spiritual life within you says, we need to get a little bit stronger. We need to get a little bit more, uh, more secure so that we can push forward. We need to be refined. God has always used discomfort to refine his people. Without discomfort, we become stagnant. Because just like the person sitting in a lounge chair, if you're just sitting in the pew, coming in, getting your fix on a Sunday morning, and you're not doing anything with it between services, you are sitting in a stagnant position, and that is not what he has called you to. We cannot expect to receive the gift of faith and hope which comes in the midst of hardship and difficulties of life if we fearfully seek to escape from the disturbing and painful realities of the world around us. We are where we are for a reason. You are born into this time for a reason. God knew what he was doing. He's intentional. You're here because he has a plan and a purpose for you. And when we become resistance to discomfort, we become resistant to the mission that he has for us. We want to enjoy life that comes from the covenant of God. The people of Israel, they enjoyed the security that they had, the protection that they had with God as their God, but slowly as they allowed other gods to infiltrate their worship, they suddenly weren't able to enjoy the perks of being the covenant people anymore. The season of exile 
might be God's way of carrying out his mission in you. The Israelites wanted to go back. But God so loved the world. See, it wasn't just about one people group. It never was. It was about a people group being refined by God to be a city on a hill to redeem the whole world. They had stopped doing that, so God said, we're going to change things up a little bit. We are charged to carry on mission even in the midst of turmoil. If we're not careful and we don't set our eyes on Jesus and endure and persevere, we will begin acting exactly like the world in the midst of difficulty. We'll become negative, we'll become bleak, we'll become disgruntled, we'll say things should not have been like this. I don't deserve this, I deserve better. My story should have a happier ending than the one I'm experiencing right now. And if we're not careful, when we start acting exactly like the world, we will lose our influence. Because why would the world look to us for a message of hope when we are just as negative as they are? We need to have a place in the midst of difficulty and turmoil that says, I know the world's burning down around me, but somehow I still have hope, and I know that my king is coming and he reigns supreme. That is the gospel. That's the message of hope. That's what separates us from every other group in the world. Embracing exile means that we have accepted our current situation and we are enduring and persevering. Now, I'm not saying don't pray when things get tough. Absolutely. But when things, are, when your prayer isn't answered the way that you think, then you have to come to a place finally realizing maybe I'm here because God wants me here. Maybe I'm in this position because God has placed me in this position for a purpose, for a reason, and maybe I should stop trying to figure out how to get out of it, and I should simply embrace it and do what he's called me to do in the midst of it. One of my favorite books is The Lord of the Rings, and there's a quote in this book without giving a a, a big summary of a three-volume series. I'll just say this. the, the, The book, I said series, not Siri. It's popping up on my phone. All right. Just to give a little summary, in this book, evil has plagued the world and there's one person who's been tasked with delivering and this person goes to his mentor and he says this word. He says, I wish that this had never come to me. I wish none of this had ever happened. His mentor, Gandalf, says, so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. That's where we are today. I know whenever we turn on the news, which I don't encourage you to do, it's easy to become discouraged, to be negative, to look at the world falling apart, to say, I wish that I wouldn't have been born in this time, but you were. So all you can decide to do at this point is do his work. Do the mission that he has called you to do in the midst of what you're walking through. We can try to pray our way out of a situation or we can embrace the reality we find ourselves in and say, maybe I was made for such a time as this. This is trusting in God's sovereignty in the midst of exile. Here's one thing that we have to accept as the church. We have to realize that when bad things happen, it is not God losing. Can I say that again? When bad things happen, it is not God losing. We have to accept the reality that when the world gets darker, the kingdom gets brighter. And we have that hope. In verse 3, as we read, he includes uh, several historic figures and shows the tension between divine sovereignty and earthly powers. Here's what he's saying. Listen, I understand that there are kings in power, and yes, they are a threat. it's It's a serious reality. But you have to understand that God is simply using those individuals for his own plans and purposes. They don't even realize it. It's unbeknownst to them, but there is a much bigger plan. God is using these political figures as a part of a large-scale strategy that, he, that they don't even understand or can't comprehend. We must trust the ultimate plan of God. When we read through the prophets and we read about the exile, there's a very important piece that I think a lot of people miss. God was the one that sent them into exile. 
in verse 4, it says, To all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And you might say, well, why would he do that? Because God has a plan. He uses exile, discomfort, to bring about refinement. And yes, there was a level of this that was punitive. There was a level of this that was punishment for violating the covenant agreement. But it was also purposeful. When God allows punishment and discipline into our lives, he's also prepared to bring about a purpose in the midst of, in the midst of it. It was punitive, but it was also purposeful because God works all things for good. Histori- historians believe that if Israel and Judah, who were once a very strong nation together, now that they had been separated, none of them had a king that was worth the throne. If they would have remained where they were, they most likely would have been completely destroyed and wiped off the face of the earth. That's what most historians believe. But because God allowed Babylon, who was a very strong nation, to come in and exile them out of where they were, bring them into their security, they were actually preserved. God tends to use unconditional means, unconventional means, to bring about his plan and purpose. One really good illustration of this would be when Jonah was thrown overboard and God sent a big fish to swallow him up. If you would have left Jonah out in the water to fend for himself, he would have drowned. But God sent a vehicle of redemption to secure him and actually took him to where he wanted him to be. Now that could have been seen as a punishment, and maybe at some level it was. But more importantly, it was purposeful, and it was continuing God's mission despite the disobedience of a person. Exile was continuing God's mission despite the disobedience of a people. Exile preserved God's people and eventually brought about the Messiah. It was within the Babylonian Babylonian captivity, we'll talk about this a little bit more next week, but that a man by the name of Daniel was raised up who prophesied not, not only of a coming king, but actually of specific historic events that led up to that coming king that shaped the history and the tradition of the Jewish people, bringing about the culture and the climate of the time when Jesus dwelt among us. This was very purposeful, very intentional, and arguably would not have happened outside of the exile. Can I just tell you today, God knows what he's doing. Even when we don't think he does, he knows what he's doing. So what do we do? Say we've embraced exile. What do we do now? Verse 5 through 7 Sheds a little bit of light. He says, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find welfare. He said, build houses, plant gardens, but don't just build them. Don't just plant them. Look, you had houses back in Jerusalem. You had gardens back in Jerusalem. You can't use them anymore. Let's face that reality. Don't just build the houses. Don't just plant the gardens. Live in the houses. Eat from the gardens. He's talking about long term situations. He's talking about get comfortable in the discomfort because you're going to be there a little while. And it's okay because I have a plan and I have a purpose. I know what I'm doing. These are long term. He said marry and reproduce. This is God's command. Maintain family life. Promote growth. Ensure continuity. Multiplication and family formation have practical and theological purposes. The demographic demographic stability of the people continuing to multiply and not decrease preserved the line of David leading up to the person of Jesus. He's saying there's a practical application here. Reproduce. You want to see the church grow? Reproduce. That's the best way for a church to grow. Produce the next generation and raise them up. Raise them up. But it also brought about a theological purpose. You have to trust me. 
God was saying, you have to trust me because things don't seem right right now. And I know that you're really, really opening, hoping that the deliverance comes soon. But I'm telling you it's going to be a little while. You don't know when it's going to be. But in the meantime, do the work that I'm calling you to do. That's what he's telling them. This is going to be long term. Stick with me. He said, seek the welfare of the city. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. In its welfare, you will find welfare. Can I say this this morning? You may not agree with everything that happens in our nation. You may not agree with the leadership in our nation. But you are required and called to seek the welfare of this nation. Because scripture says, in its welfare, you will find welfare. Why would you speak against a nation that you live in? You may not agree with everything, just like the Israelites didn't agree with everything about Babylon, but they were called to pray for its welfare because it was the hand that fed them. It's the same way. We are called to pray to the Lord on our nation's behalf, on our community's behalf. This is responding to exile in faith and in hope. Verses 8 through 9 says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Now in this passage here, we kind of get the idea that there are false prophets who are being raised up, and we actually see in a couple uh, verses in 24 through 32 that a specific prophet is being called out He's saying, don't be swayed by these messages. Seek God's truth and wisdom, not just human predictions and self-assurance. We don't know what these false prophecies were. We don't know much about it. We do know that this particular prophet in verses uh, 24 through 32 was challenging Jeremiah's authority. We don't know the content of his prophecy, but we can deduce that it was probably opposed to everything Jeremiah was saying. So the prophecy might have looked something like this. This is just a minor setback. The deliverance will be coming soon. Contrasted to Jeremiah saying, God has a plan that will probably exceed our lifetime. The false prophecy may have said, discomfort is bad. Pray and pray that God would deliver us. And Jeremiah is saying, God is working in the discomfort, refining us to be a part of his grand mission. The false prophecy might have said, we are victims and the only good that can come out of this is from us being delivered from our current suffering, either by our hand or by God's. Jeremiah was saying, God and his sovereignty has sent us into exile. He will bring good in the long run. The false prophecy might have been saying, revolt, destroy the city, seek the downfall of our captives. But Jeremiah was saying, God desires you to occupy until he returns. Build houses, multiply, pray for and seek the welfare of your captors. Why? Because Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. He said, stop trying to pray yourself out of the situation I put you in and do what I called you to do. Stop looking at the sky saying one of these days it's going to be any time. Now it might be, but until he comes back, do the work that he's called us to do. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. Listen, there are a lot of prophecies and messages and visions and dreams and books that make a lot of money out there trying to change a narrative and place this prediction on when Jesus is going to come back. The reality is we don't know. And the reality is the reason why people make so much money on those books is because no one can hold them accountable to it. We don't know what's going to happen. One day we're all going to stand in heaven and realize we probably all got it wrong. Here's what I know beyond the shadow of a doubt. Jesus is coming back, and I don't know when it'll be. But I'll tell you what I have found is more stimulating and produces work in me is not to constantly think, it's going to be any second now, it's going to be any second now, but it's to think, you know what, it could be a long time, which causes me to take the time to make sure that my children are raised up with the right values because there is a serious possibility that they will outlive me. 
There is a serious possibility that they will be here in a time that I'm not there to guide my sons anymore. So I need to make sure that I am preparing them for the possibility that we could be here a long time. The prophecy of Jeremiah is to say, listen, you need to understand that there is a deliverance coming. But until it does, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat from them, multiply, produce Raise up the next generation because God has a plan that if anything has been proven to us, we don't understand it. And the more we try to predict it, the more we get it wrong. We have to work until he returns. That's what we're called to do. He has plans. He has purposes for us. But we have to stop trying to get away from the discomfort, get away from the things that we don't like, and realize that it's in those seasons that he refines us the most, that he works in us and produces what he's wanting to produce in us. And he's saying, I know that it doesn't make sense right now, but you have to trust me. There is so much more happening than what you can see. In the book of Job, you read about a man who experienced great turmoil, great trial, and you get this idea that God is involved in it and allowing certain things to happen. And it's easy on the forefront of that book to say, what in the world is happening? Why would God do this? And Job, of course, is asking the same question, and he finally demands an audience with God. He says, God, you better show up and defend what you're doing. You ever been there? And God does, which is scarier than if he didn't. And he shows up, and in the loving, kind way that only God can, he looks at Job and says, where were you whenever I created the earth? The point being, Job wasn't there. God never answers Job's question. But Job repents. He repents not because he mourned the loss of his children, He repents because he tried to understand and think the way that God thought. There are so many things to God's story and his plan and his purpose that you and I will never understand because we simply can't comprehend it. There is so much going on beyond the scenes that we can't even wrap our minds around, but yet we become hyper fixated on our story And it's got to have a happy ending the way that I see it to be that we miss what God's actually trying to do through us. Maybe through us in the way that we bring up those who are yet to come. There's a bigger plan and a purpose than any of us can wrap our minds around and it happens in the place of exile. So stand with me this morning. In just a moment, we will offer communion as we normally do. And it's my responsibility before we do to call you to a place of repentance. And remember, repentance isn't just remorse. It's not just saying, I'm not going to do that bad thing anymore. But it's saying, God, I don't understand. I can't understand. So you're going to have to expand my capacity to see your perspective just a little bit more. See, it's counterintuitive to look at exile and embrace it. The reason why it's natural to revolt is because that's, again, the most natural thing we could do. And we should pray for good things in our life, but when you've been praying and praying and praying for the same thing and you're just not seeing relief, you might need to stop and say, maybe God's in this. And it's not beyond God to use discomfort in your life to bring about the results he wants to. Now, I don't think it's possible from a human perspective to embrace trials and tribulations on our own. But that's why we have the Holy Spirit who brings about a sense of perspective. So today, as you are searching your heart in reflection, I just ask you to invite the Holy Spirit to widen your perspective to see Not that you're going to understand all of it, but to understand that there's plenty that you don't understand. And you don't need to understand. You simply need to trust Him. Ask Him to help you to embrace exile. If you've been in the season for a while and you just don't find that relief, I 
encourage you to invite the Holy Spirit to prompt you to get to work. Get to work in the midst of it. If things aren't changing around you, build houses in the midst of it. Plant gardens in the midst of it. Do the work he's called you to do right where you are. Again, I don't think that's possible from a human perspective, but with God, all things are possible. And I believe that the Holy Spirit can move in your heart to say, I'm going to make the best out of the season that I'm in and do the work he's called me. And lastly, this morning, there are a lot of distractions out there. A lot of things that are trying to pull our attention from the truth of Scripture. His job, the Holy Spirit's job is to bring you into all truth to give you a discerning spirit to weed through those things that are not valuable to you and to focus on the things that are. Allow him to do that work in you this morning. Allow him to shape your heart, expand your capacity, blow your mind with understanding that God has such a bigger plan than anything that you or I could ever comprehend. But yet he knows the plans that he has for you plans of a hope, a future. Let's worship this morning. Let's reflect and let's allow the Holy Spirit to do the work that only He can.